Welcome, everybody. My name is John Collins. I'm the director of the library, your host for this evening. Um, this, is bec this is the eighth annual Jean Shaw lecture, and it's sort of like a homecoming, a reunion. A lot of us knew Jean, loved Jean, worked with her, so it's good to see familiar faces. For those of you who didn't know Jean, we put, um, we're not going to run through her resume and tell you her whole story, but on the um, chairs, there is uh, some biographical information. Um, when she passed away, we raised some money in an endowment in her name, and that's what uh, funds this event tonight. <laughs> it also gives an award to a doctoral student and supports a visiting researcher, who, both of whom you will meet. Um, what's going to happen um, this evening is we'll have our talk with, by our uh, esteemed visitor, um, questions and answers, then we'll give the awards, um, then there'll be a reception as doors will open and you're all invited to join us for some uh, good food and drink and um, conversation. Um, many of you received uh, invitations in the mail. We put some of these on the seats too. If you didn't get one and you want to get on our list for this particular lecture, feel free to fill it out and leave it in the, um, a basket out on one of the tables out there. So let's uh, begin. I would like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Lee Indrasano from Boston University, a member of the Chal Advisory Board, and she will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Memorial 
Thank you very much, Lee. I hope that's not too loud. Can I turn it down just a bit? I feel as though I'm among friends. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for inviting me, the Gene Chaw Committee. Um, it's always nice to get out of town and come to a place that's a little bit different, a little bit new, a little bit interesting, very interesting. I got a chance, I came in last night, got a chance to walk around campus. It's only my, only my second time that I've been here, and so it was, it was quite a pleasure. At any rate, it's very nice to be here. What I'm going to talk to you today about is a paper that I'm currently working on that I've just recently decided to call Optimal Outfitting. I think the lecture was titled, Is Culturally Responsive Instruction Still Relevant? And I put that in smaller type down below so you can still see it. At any rate, I'm playing around with a number of ideas here that are important to me in terms of my current project. Lee mentioned Translate. Translate is teaching, reading, and new strategic learning approaches to English learners. Hope you got that. That's our acronym and we're sticking to it. <laughs> um, I think it's a very exciting approach for thinking about working with students who are um, learning English as an additional language and I'm going to talk a little bit about that towards the end of the presentation. But right now I want to show you something a little bit different. Let's see if I can make this work. I need to Ah. Okay. I don't know if it's working. Hmm. Ah, it was turned off. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. I'm showing you a picture of a motorcycle. Um, this is a motorcycle that my uncle gave me a ride on 45 years ago. And ever since that time, I have been hopelessly in love with riding motorcycles. And every chance I get, I hop on top of one. This is a two-stroke, two-cylinder Yamaha 305 uh, Big Bear motorcycle that changed my outlook on life um, forever after I had a chance to ride on it. And since that time, since 1945, uh, 1967, I'm sorry, I have owned 10 different motorcycles, and this is my most current acquisition. This is a KTM 990 Adventure motorcycle. One of the things you'll notice about this motorcycle, not a Harley, uh, we belong to a different tribe. <laughs> At any rate, um, motorcycles are wonderful because they so almost free you from the limits imposed on, on us by gravity. They let you do things that you simply can't do in any other way. Um, it's a completely different experience from driving an automobile. Uh, the, the lean sensations and the acceleration are, are something that are completely unique to this particular vehicle. At any rate, even though they do a lot of things incredibly well, one of the things they don't do very well at all is they don't allow you to take very much stuff with you. And therefore, they need modifications. They need some adaptations if you're going to use them in the ways that at least I like to use them. I like to travel on motorcycles. I want them to take me places. So one of the first things you do as a motorcyclist is you start thinking about how can I make this motorcycle do the things that I want it to do? And one of the th most important things that I want my motorcycles to do is allow me to take things with me. And so you have to find luggage. And this luggage is actually difficult to find and it's incredibly expensive. And the way that you find the luggage that you need for your particular motorcycle is you've got to find folks who have the exact same machine that you do, and you have to spend time talking with them and listening to them about what exactly, um, well, asking them the questions that you have about what you want that luggage to do. So I was very fortunate when I bought this particular motorcycle and that a good friend of mine living in Illinois has one just like it and he had the luggage that I needed and was willing to sell it to me. So I got it, I put it on there, um, but it taught me a lesson that the people who are closest to the particular vehicle that one owns are the folks that you need to talk to. And that, I'm gonna use this as a metaphor for thinking about culturally responsive instruction now. Because the people that have the information that is most necessary for thinking about the instruction that you're going to provide 
two students from diverse backgrounds are the students themselves as well as members of their families and their communities. At any rate, these are the questions that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to ask what is culturally responsive pedagogy and try to answer that. Why is culturally responsive pedagogy needed? How did culturally responsive pedagogy emerge historically? And what historical elements figure into how it might be conceptualized? How can we improve and develop culturally responsive pedagogy through research? What issues, questions, and controversies does it address or inspire? And what are its likely benefits and what will be lost if we fail to consider it? One of the things I like a great deal about culturally responsive pedagogy is it forces me as a researcher and as a teacher to constantly think about the information that I'm presenting to my students. It forces me to go into their communities and talk to the folks, um, to their parents, to their families, to the students themselves, and learn what are the issues and concerns, ways of living, linguistic practices, and cultural practices that they're engaged in. And this last, uh, let's see, winter break, I got a chance to do a little bit of reading. And I found a book called uh, Literacy and Power in the Ancient World. And it provided me with a really nice illustration of why we need to constantly refresh the curriculum and the instruction that we're providing to students, all students, but especially students from diverse backgrounds. At any rate, what you see is a picture of Romans in a Roman school. And what I found out was that during late antiquity, just before the fall of the Roman Empire, literacy and literacy instruction was literally what held the empire together at that particular moment in time. Students, primarily the children of the elites, had to attend school for between five to 10 years. And during that time, they had to learn uh, a small set of the, the Latin ca canon, or the Greek canon, depending on what part of the empire they lived in. But their job was to learn all of the rules of phonology, all of the rules of morphology, and all of the rules of grammar in relationship to the literary canon that they were studying. I thought that was very, very interesting. So for between five and 10 years, they're working assiduously to acquire all of these rules. So you ask, well, what purpose would that have served? Um, why would they spend so much time learning the rules of phonology, morphology, and grammar? The reason they did it was so that other members of the elites would recognize them when they came into contact. In other words, absolutely correct language was everything in the particular world in which they lived. It didn't do them very much good in terms of the jobs they went out and had to fulfill. It didn't help them very much in terms of keeping the empire together, in terms of maintaining the roads and the aqueducts and keeping the barbarians outside of the, outside of the empire. But it did a really good job of making sure that only members of the elites occupied bureaucratic posts within the Roman Empire. And I think that's a huge danger. It's something that needs to be thought about continuously in an ongoing basis. And culturally responsive pedagogy provides us one mechanism for really constantly moving back and forth between communities, students, and the instruction and the curriculum that we're providing to them. It, it occurred to me as I was thinking about this particular talk that the practices, uh, the, the linguistic and the cultural practices of students from diverse backgrounds, if you're thinking about them from a social practices perspective, are probably much better connected to the larger macro structures of the, of the economy, um, the political uh, field of production, as well as the, uh, the cultural field of production than are the practices and ways of thinking and doing work that are currently found within the curriculum that we are teaching to students. In other words, I think there's a tighter, potentially a tighter fit between the practices that students are engaged in and that they're familiar with and the larger uh, macro structures of, of, of the economy and, and politics than those that are represented in the curriculum that we're currently providing to students. So potentially, culturally responsive pedagogy has this possibility of being a much more um, relevant form of instruction 
than what we typically provide to students. Probably a lot of you are familiar with the work of Basil Bernstein. And Basil Bernstein argues that one of the reasons why the instruction and the activities that we ask students to engage in in school classrooms today in places like the United States, one of the reasons why those are so off-putting and alienating to a lot of the students that find themselves in those classrooms is that those practices, those forms of knowledge have been decontextualized from their primary fields of production and they've been brought into the school. They've, been, um, they, they've sort of been stripped of the connections that they had to their um, class-based backgrounds, to the, to the economy, to their gendered relationships. And so students encounter these practices within classrooms without really understanding how they fit in to the larger world in which they are a part. So just one really simple example, I think, of the, the, the practice of teaching students to write persuasive letters, right? You find it's, it's almost ubiquitous within lots of US classrooms. But when students are asked to write persuasive letters, they, don't, they aren't told or they aren't, it isn't explained to them that people write persuasive letters because of certain kinds of power relationships of which they are a part. Um, they're trying to accomplish certain goals that have been imposed upon them by the economic social structures of which they live in that, um, that they're not able to accomplish because of the fact that they don't have the kinds of power necessary to achieve those ends more directly. So writing persuasive letters is just probably one small example of how a practice from a, a particular field of production is decontextualized, then recontextualized for teaching within the schools in such a way that students often don't understand how those kinds of practices are connected to what really matters to them. So because of this, hmm, a little dry because of allergies. Oh, ah, I went too far. Sorry about that. Ah, am I going? I'm going forward. No. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know how I got so far ahead. Ah, here we are. There we are. Ah. <laughs> I almost had a, a nervous breakdown <laughs> as we were getting set up today. We couldn't get a, a video to work. At any rate, um, looking at going into the communities and trying to figure out what is it that students from diverse backgrounds are doing and the kinds of language and literacy practices that are familiar to them, trying to really just determine and identify them, requires a really um, major break in the way that we typically think about students from diverse backgrounds. Because schools have not typically been uh, very open or welcoming of the language and literacy practices of students from diverse backgrounds. Just a little example, I was looking for video clips on YouTube recently to show to my students different forms of English around the United States, Appalachian English, Hawaiian Creole, African American dialect in different parts of the country. And what really struck me when I was looking at these video clips is that not so much the folks that were speaking, even though that was very interesting because it was hard to, you know, I often wondered how did these people get selected to be examples of this particular dialect. But what I found really fascinating were the comments that folks made after the video clips. And there were things like, this is just incredibly lazy English. These people just don't want to work hard. Um, when I look, when I listen to somebody talking like this, and I think they were referring to a Chicano in East LA, it seems to me that this person is just an incredible low life. And so Carol Lee points this out. She says, this requires a major break in thinking about the value of what's going on within the communities that a lot of teachers and, and researchers are interested in. We've got we've to figure out ways to break from what uh, Pierre Bourdieu calls the obviousness of ordinary experience. He argues that this is something that's just extremely difficult for lots of folks 
within school context to think about. And Carol, Carol makes that clear. I want to come over here. Um, she, she argues that we need to privilege the linguistic resources that students bring from their everyday linguistic practices and repertoires outside of school into the school setting. Um, Geneva Gay provides us with a really nice, what I think is a good definition of culturally responsive pedagogy when she says, it's an approach that teaches to and through students cultural and personal strengths, their intellectual capabilities and their prior accomplishments. And Louis Small, one of my heroes in the field, argues that the social, cultural, and linguistic processes of students from diverse backgrounds are the greatest resource we have for bringing about educational change. So very strong claims about the potential and the possibilities of educational change. And Jim Cummins makes a statement that I couldn't quite memorize because he's got so many embedded clauses in his in his writing, but he says, and I'll read it to you, it is the failure of the mainstream educational reform movement to recognize the socio-political roots of student failure that is a major factor in the limited impact that this research has exerted on reversing the process of educational inequality. Hope you got that. Um, it is the failure of the mainstream educational reform movement to recognize the socio-political roots of student failure that really is the problem in terms of how do we turn things around and provide more equitable instruction to students from diverse backgrounds. However, there are some who object to this. And I found a few critiques. I was looking for them. One major critique is that the kinds of practices, the kinds of language use, the ways of knowing and doing life outside of the academy, outside of schools, for some, is highly problematic. And here are a couple of quotes that I pulled from a chapter written by John Bransford and his colleagues at University of Washington. Um, he's quoting others here. This, these aren't, this isn't his point of view. But there are people who say things like, informal lead learning leads people to form naive and misconceived ideas at odds with disciplinary knowledge. And I think some of you are probably familiar with a recent study that I think looked at graduates, undergraduates, graduates of the undergraduate program at Harvard and um, by and large, the, the, the notion was that the seasons change because the Earth gets closer to the sun during its orbit. Um, in other words, instead of the Earth tilting as it rotates around the sun, it actually gets closer to the sun. And for many, this is an idea that's out there. It's a misconception, obviously. In other words, one has to be very careful about which practices which forms of understanding, which knowledge, or what knowledge one brings into uh, the school setting. And I think Bernstein provides us with some tools for thinking about that. How do we decontextualize that information, and how do we bring it into the, the, the school setting? And I think when we're talking about culturally responsive instruction and the linguistic and cultural practices of students from diverse backgrounds, I think there are ways to really think critically and thoughtfully about what is it that students are doing outside of the school setting that could be valuable within the school setting? So one really nice example would be something like um, dual language immersion ed education. There are folks who argued, or who do argue even now, that if we go out into the communities and we find practices that we think will be relevant to teaching within the school uh, context, that all we're really going to do is reproduce the advantage of students from elite backgrounds. And this actually has happened in a number of cases. There, there are, for example, um, students who engage in, um, say, uh, comic book or fanzine kinds of affinity groups. When those practices come into the school, the notion was that this would be useful for students from working class backgrounds. But what, what researchers found, it actually reinforce the privilege that many students from elite backgrounds um, take advantage of when they find themselves in school settings. But in a, in a situation like dual language immersion instruction, people like Guadalupe Valdez have argued, we've got to be really careful about this. When we bring the languages of students from diverse backgrounds into the school context, we, do run, we actually do run the risk of providing students from mainstream backgrounds 
more of an advantage, more privilege than they currently have. And I think the uptake of this is that one has to carefully monitor what's going on to make sure that instruction is equitable, to make sure that students from diverse backgrounds are not being somehow slighted in that give and take in the kinds of interactions that occur between um, teachers and students. And, and I think there's been some success with that. So there, there, are, there are reasons to hope that this can be done if, like I said before, it's done thoughtfully, carefully, and probably with a theoretical uh, set of tools for deciding how to make sure that we don't um, privilege the already privileged even more than, than is currently the case. I want to pivot just a little bit in terms of my comments. Here's a, <coughs> a picture that our tech advisor at Vanderbilt University found for me. And I'm showing it to you because I think um, the group that I'm most interested in, students who are learning English as an additional language, have over a very long period of time experienced problems in school settings. So what we find is that um, graduation rates for immigrant students at the turn of the last century was about half of what the graduation rates were for students from mainstream settings. One researcher, Joel Perlman, a sociologist, found that students from Polish and Italian backgrounds were, were graduating at about a 15%, 17% rate, whereas students from uh, what he called native white and native English speaking parents were graduating at about a 30 to 35%. So all groups were performing at very low levels, but students from immigrant backgrounds were performing at, at even lower levels. Um, one really interesting publication from 1911, the Dillingham Commission, some of you might be familiar with it, uh, found that students from German American backgrounds were, 50% uh, of those students were at least a year or more behind in terms of their academic achievement. 60% uh, of students from Russian Jewish backgrounds were at least a year or more behind in terms of their academic achievement. Um, students of Italian speaking backgrounds, 77% of them were at least a year or more behind in terms of their academic achievement. Now obviously it wasn't that some students from certain groups were more intelligent than students from other groups. It was that there were all kinds of impediments and obstacles to the student's success in, within those settings. I found the language from one piece of legislation from, from that time, and I'll, I'll read it to you just to give you a sense of the ways that folks from elite backgrounds thought about students from immigrant backgrounds. Here, and here's what the legislation said. Sought to bar entrance to all idiots, insane persons, paupers, or persons likely to become a public charge, persons suffering from a contagious disease, persons who have been convicted of a felony or other infamous crime or misdemeanor involving moral turpitude. We probably could apply that. Some of those same ways of thinking about immigrants are currently still with us even today. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting. One, one means that um, the, re the immigration restriction has tried to use during that time to bar the admission of immigrants into the United States was a literacy test. And as a literacy educator, I found this especially interesting. The idea was that literacy was a very neutral um, means for, for making that decision. But what was very interesting was that it was sort of put into place at a time when the previous wave of immigrants had been mostly um, unschooled and came into the United States illiterate, one could say. Uh, and, and what, what actually happened was is that during the interim between the passage of the legislation and the thinking of folks from that time period, most, most immigrant arrivals were coming to the United States already literate. They could read and write in their first language, so they failed in that attempt. They kept trying. The immigration restrictionists kept trying. And a lot of you are probably familiar with the fact that in 1924, the Johnson-Reed Act actually barred admission to almost all immigrants into the United States. And the ways that that was accomplished was they wrote into the law that only 2% of immigrant groups from each group could be admitted into the United States at the time of their presence in the United States during the 1890 census, which literally ensured that no one from 
Eastern European Jewish background, Italian Greek background would be allowed to enter into the United States after that, that point in time. At any rate, I found this really interesting once I started digging into the history of culturally relevant pedagogy or culturally responsive pedagogy. Wanted to know more about it. So I asked a really good colleague of mine, Rich Milner. Some of you may know Rich. He does a lot of work in this area. I said, Rich, whose work should I read in terms of being one of the very earliest folks to think about these issues in, in culturally relevant pedagogy? He said, you've got to read this book by W.E.B. Du Bois, um, The Souls of Black Folk. And, and my guess is a lot of you know he was the first to receive a doctorate here at Harvard, or first African American to receive a doctorate here at Harvard. But what I didn't know about W.E.B. Du Bois is that he was an undergraduate student oops, at Fisk University in Nashville. And he received professional development to be a teacher. And he went out to do his student teaching um, in, 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 a, in a wonderful, beautiful story. If you get a chance to look at his book, I, I, actually, I really encourage you to do this because he says, he, got, he just went walking from the city of Nashville on Lebanon Pike, and he walked for 40 miles until he found this little bitty town in Tennessee called Watertown. And he asked, do you have a teacher? And they said, no, we don't have a teacher. But that's where he got his student teaching placement, in a one-room schoolhouse with a bunch of wonderful children that he describes in, in great detail, as well as he provides a great many other stories. Um, but he... This is the part that I, that, this is the only part that he wrote about what he did when he was a teacher in that little one room schoolhouse in Watertown, Tennessee. He said, we read and spelled together, we wrote a little, we picked flowers, we sang and listened to stories of the world beyond the hill. Besides being incredibly poetic and beautifully written, I like to read into that lots of culturally responsive pedagogic techniques. I'm, I'm guessing that what they read were stories that were familiar to the students, that the songs that they sang would have been songs that they would have been familiar with, um, that the stories that they listened to of the world beyond the hill would have also been stories that would have caught their attention and kept them um, listening to what he was talking about. I, I actually get to go to Watertown on my motorcycle every now and then. It's in a very pretty part of the state. There are no pictures of W.E.B. Du Bois there. And I, 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 mean, I need to make it a point to talk to folks because they do have pictures of their current mayor and former mayors on the side of some of the buildings in that town. And I'm thinking, you're a really famous person. You've got to make sure you, you recognize him. Uh, one of the other, uh, well, one thing I do want to say is Angela Valenz or Angela Valenzuela wrote this great book called um, subtractive schooling about a high school in Houston, Texas. And she makes a comment in that book where she says, if we really want to be effective in terms of our work with students from diverse backgrounds, we have to become students of the histories of subordination of those communities. Students of the histories of subordination of those communities. And I thought, this book, The Souls of Black, Black Folk, um, would make an excellent curriculum of the histories of subordination of African Americans, or at least a part of that history of subordination of African Americans. He, he does fantastic economic analysis and makes it very clear and points out how um, white America has benefited tremendously from the labor of African Americans, uh, unpaid labor. And he, and he tells these great stories about he's teaching white folks about black folks. I mean, that's one of his goals in that book. And he does a, a really excellent job. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. He tells the stories very straightforwardly um, and with, uh, with a very unvarnished brush. I, I felt as though I, I knew the folks that he was talking about. One other person whose work really has caught my attention and has kept it over a very long period of time is jo um, George Sanchez. Is anyone here from Texas or spend time in Texas? The College of Education at the University of Texas in Austin is named for George Sanchez. Sanchez is fascinating to me because he wrote this book called Forgotten People. It was published in 1940. Obviously, uh, the work and the research had been done 
a great deal before that time. Sanchez was an incredible pioneer in challenging a lot of the sort of racist and erroneous ideas that educators had about Latino students um, during that period. So one of the things he did that, that really caught his attention was uh, the practice of giving IQ tests to um, Mexican American kids and on the basis of the fact that they didn't know all of the English vocabulary on the test, they were being categorized as mentally um, deficient. And what he did, he, this wonderful little experiment for his master's thesis, he taught them the English vocabulary on the IQ test. And then he retested them and found that, lo and behold, magically, their IQs rose, a um, couple standard deviations. So really, really interesting work. But later he wrote this book about forgotten people. And in this text, he argues that instruction, the curriculum, needs to be made available to kids from, uh, from Mexican-American backgrounds, but it needs to be adapted to the custom traditions, language, and historical backgrounds of students. And he specifically points at Mexican music, Mexican folklore, architecture, foods, crafts, and customs. So I like to think of Sanchez as maybe one of the grandparents of culturally responsive instruction, as well as W.E.B. Du Bois. Some of the other early pioneers of culturally responsive pedagogy, Ramirez and Castaneda wrote a book called um, Cultural Democracy and Bicognitive Development in 1974 and really started playing with this idea that bilingualism might just be an asset and something to think about in positive terms. Very, very early, James Banks wrote this wonderful article on educational leadership at about the same time. And in that article, he said, he argued, we must respect the cultural and linguistic backgrounds of students so that they might gain the power they need to change society. He's the first one whose work I looked at who starts talking about power and how instruction can have an impact and change power relationships within the larger society. Kleinfeld did some really interesting work early, early on with Inuit students, uh, Native Alaskan students in Alaska. And she, she very carefully and in a detailed way documented the problems these kids were having as they left their villages and went to schools uh, in, in nearby towns and found that one of the primary reasons they were having problems was that they didn't understand how people were related to one another. They didn't understand how the social networks operated in the places where they were being sent to, where they, where they were going to live. And that once this was focused on, uh, once this was being explained to them, they were able to participate at higher levels. She's the first one to use the term warm demanders, by the way. Very, very interesting. Push the kids hard, but make sure they understand you really care about them, that you're there to provide them with the very best instruction you possibly can. I, uh, board track racer, motorcycle turn of the last century. We've had motorcycles now since 1890, if you didn't know that. Some of the other folks who are, these are the people that I started reading when I was a graduate student. Catherine Ow's work, Louise Moll's work, uh, Shirley Bryce Heath's work, Susan Phillips' work. I know you're all familiar with their work, but the reason I put them up there is because they're the first to actually start finding practices, linguistic practices primarily, within the communities and the homes of the students that they are researching and figuring out ways to decontextualize those practices, recontextualize them within the school setting, and then they start to document through research greater levels, higher levels of participation of those same students. So with Kathy Ao and her colleagues looking at um, students in Hawaii in the Kamehameha schools, finding that kids are participating more when talk story is implemented, when they can talk at the same time as other kids. Louise Small and his colleagues are finding that when kids read texts in English, if they discuss it in Spanish, they're talking about much more sophisticated topics than when they are forced to talk about it only in English. Shirley Bryce Heath finds that just a simple modification of the questions that students are being asked results in higher levels of participation. And Susan Phillips finds on the Warm Springs Reservation in Oregon that kids are talking more, participating more, when the teacher doesn't force them to talk or call on them to talk, when they're actually allowed to decide when they should speak and, and when they shouldn't speak. So very, very interesting. First time this is happening 
practices are being brought into the school, changes are being documented, but usually on a very small scale with maybe the exception of Catherine Au's work. So a big question that most folks have about culturally responsive pedagogy, is it effective? And here's one of the responses to that from the uh, National Reading Commission, right? Uh, some of you may know the work of Claude Goldenberg, Robert Rueda, and Diane August, but this is a really sobering sort of indictment of culturally responsive instruction. They said that despite a belief among many in the field that instruction tailored to different cultural groups is superior to instruction based on general principles of teaching and learning, there is a paucity of data to support this claim. And of course, they're looking for experimental data. They're looking for randomized controlled trial um, research, not a problem. Um, and they're also only looking at literacy research. They're only looking at um, research uh, dealing with students who are learning a second language. So they're not looking at all research on culturally responsive instruction. But that's, that's the conclusion that they drew. And my guess is you could probably apply that to a lot of other areas. But then we've got folks like Geneva Gay who are making statements, very bold statements, and I like what she's saying, but very much um, very different from what folks from other traditions. When the instructional processes are congruent with the cultural orientations, experiences, and learning styles of marginalized African American, Latino, Native, and Asian American students, their achievement improves significantly. Okay, so th it's night and day difference in terms of the conclusion she's drawing. And again, she's looking at a somewhat different body of research or literature base. Um, she's looking, she's accepting at face value many of the small scale studies that I've already mentioned, but still very different sort of conclusion. I didn't, I haven't yet done a full review of all the research in this area, and that's on my list of things to do. But one of the conclusions that I draw from these two very different ways of thinking about culturally responsive research is that there have been calls for more work in the area. And lots of folks who are from a very qualitative, ethnographically oriented backgrounds are making um, uh, suggestions and recommendations that we need larger scale studies. So this is very interesting. I think the only way that's going to happen is if people start working together. There's more collaboration among researchers from different kinds of traditions. How does culturally responsive instruction or pedagogy differ from effective teaching? And the best answer to that that I could find was one that Gloria Latson Billings wrote. And she says, first of all and foremost, it produces students who achieve academically. Uh, Christine Sleater, in a wonderful article that was just published in Urban Education, says that this most important characteristic of culturally responsive pedagogy has been ignored by too many folks that's in the field. That for most folks, for a lot of people, she claims, um, are focusing on celebrating cultural backgrounds rather than thinking about how can culturally responsive pedagogy improve academic achievement. But points two and three, especially three, I think is what distinguishes culturally responsive pedagogy from just good teaching. The goal here is to produce students who can both understand and critique the existing social order. Getting back to that idea that James Banks mentioned earlier. Yeah. I don't know if you're open to your question. Mm. Uh, mm. Okay. Would you mind if I did that? Yeah, no. Okay. I'll, so I hope that I can get through. It does it stereotype students? A huge question in the field. Are we essentializing kids when we implement culturally responsive instruction? I think there's some great answers, and I've got several. Some of the most exciting work in this area that I think responds to this, this idea is that by Django Paris. And what I love about Django's work is he's, he looks at students in interaction with one another. So in his latest book, uh, I can't remember the title of it right now, but he, he looks at Samoan, Mexican-American, and African-American kids, and he's looking particularly at how they're all influencing one another and how they're picking up on the language practices of one another. And, and, and Professor Paris says, we need to figure out ways to focus on those kinds of language practices 
and, and bring those into the school setting. So I think that's one way to avoid essentializing students. Um, let's see, I'll just jump down to what Chris Gutierrez and her colleagues say. Research designs must be sensitive enough to document both the regularity and variance of students' behaviors. Uh, Chris argues that we also have to make sure that we do document the linguistic and language practices of students both in school and, and, and out of school settings. And we need to understand what those are and not, uh, let's see, not focus on their deficiencies is what she argues. But then she says that our research designs need to make sure that we document the regularities as well as the variances in their behavior so that we get a broader, more uh, well fleshed out understanding of who the kids are and how they respond to forms of culturally responsive instruction. What are the best fit with academic practices? Um, Carol Lee says, the practices that we bring into the school settings need to pose a problem of interpretation similar to what students will meet in the different content areas. I think this is an area where a lot of theoretical, um, intellectual work is absolutely necessary. Uh, the best example of this, I think, is Marjorie Orellana's work and her colleague Reynolds, in which they look at language brokering practices of Latino students in the Chicago area. And they do what I think is a beautiful analytical job of describing how kids engage in the process of language brokering and how it differs according to the text that they're translating, how it differs according to the amount of assistance that they're receiving from their parents while they are translating for them, and how it differs de depending on um, some other factors as well. I, I think these are the ways that practices need to be thought about and, and, and considered before proposals are made to bring them into the school setting. Uh, what can researchers do? I like to say that we need to implement research approaches that include development, implementation, and evaluation components of the proposed approach. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. We need to include teacher development as a goal of the approach. We need to aim towards developing specific forms of pedagogy that are the form of current assessments. Jim Cummins makes that comment. Very, very important. I think too often recommendations are made to make instruction culturally responsive without the intellectual and theoretical work that's necessary to make sure we don't make horrible mistakes. And, and there have been a lot of horrible mistakes. I, I think of the Bank Street Riders, for example, um, where they were developed without really consulting members of the community. And then they were rejected by members of that same community because not enough work had gone into really understanding what community members wanted. OK. Here's a whole long list of recommendations. I found these in a number of different areas, and I won't go through them all. But they're, they're all really great ideas, but they haven't been developed. Research hasn't been conducted on. They haven't been tried out. So how much time do I have left? A couple more minutes? OK. So this is something that my colleagues and I are working on. And I mentioned early in the talk the translate approach, teaching, reading, and new strategic uh, learning approaches to English learners. This is what we're doing, um, my doctoral students and myself, as well as a few colleagues. We're trying to figure out how to make students' understanding of their first language, um, how we can leverage that to, to improve their comprehension of English language text. So because I'm at Vanderbilt and because I have all these wonderful colleagues in the areas of design research, and I've learned a great deal about it since moving there eight years ago, we've developed an instructional approach that aims to do these things. Help kids move from seeing reading as a meaningless activity towards one that results in understanding. Move from viewing translation as a mechanical activity towards understanding its usefulness for comprehension. And help move them from thinking about bilingualism as a problem towards thinking about it as a potentially valuable resource. We're working with. Uh, in three different middle schools with kids from Spanish-speaking backgrounds, kids from Somali-speaking backgrounds, as well as kids from Kurdish-speaking backgrounds. Uh, Nashville, if you didn't know, is, a, is a, one of the designated refugee centers in the United States. So students from a wide variety of backgrounds. We're now receiving Bhutanese and Burmese students in the Nashville uh, metropolitan schools. So these are some things that we're hoping to implement. And we're doing this in a state that's an English-only state. So where teachers are not allowed to use the student's language, 
but we're, we've developed an approach that I think is somewhat subversive and that if the teachers don't do it, the kids do it. So here's what we've developed. This is our instructional protocol and we developed this over a period of about two years working in these three different middle schools. I'll just read the, the main points to you. We get kids, connect students to text. We have them read selected materials, the novels that are part of their standard curriculum. We ask them to write down what they think is most important in that text. We then ask them to translate one or two sentences within the text after we teach them strategies for identifying what's most important in the novels they're reading. Then we have the kids work in collaborative learning groups where they evaluate each other's translations and they argue over who has developed the best translation. Um, and then they summarize previous read material in both their first language and in their second language, English. And here, I'm going to show you the kids doing that. Hopefully this will work. Seventh grade boys. He's trying to write it down. like that? <laughs> and. Okay. Um, the reason I showed you that video is because there's two parts to it. The first part is a typical guided reading lesson and they're bored and it shows. Um, 
Kelly does not speak their language. He's a monolingual English speaker. He knows a tiny little bit of Spanish. But once the kids start translating, and this is something we're trying to figure out, how can we develop instructional protocols where the kids actually get to use their first language to think about what they're reading in English. These are seventh grade boys. These, they're pretty challenging. These are tough kids, really nice kids, but they're not that easy to get focused on academic kinds of tasks. But in this particular video, I think it's, at least for me, it was incredibly clear that this is, this is the kind of goal that we're aiming towards. Now, they didn't do this every single time we got together, but I think this was one of the best examples that we've got of what happens when you allow children or young people to bring in all of their language resources to think about what they're doing in terms of reading comprehension. Okay, that's about all that I wanted to share with you. Um, one of my conclusions for the talk is sometimes you just need a new motorcycle. And uh, recently I just sold a motorcycle that I had for 13 years and bought a new one that was the blue one that you saw. Uh, it was getting old, it had 60,000 miles on it. It had done its work and I was ready for something brand new. I think that applies to, in, to um, instructional approaches as well. These approaches probably won't work with the next generation of kids. They will only work with this first generation or maybe with generation 1.5. We're gonna have to rethink what we're doing. That gets stale very quickly without that constant back and forth understanding of the community. Um, the second point I wanna make is there's an inherent dilemma in culturally responsive pedagogy that's really a difficult one and I haven't entirely figured it out. Some of you might actually be able to help me is how can we be responsive to local conditions? Carol Lee tells us we have to do that and at the same time, develop larger scale um, instructional exper experiments or classroom-based experiments where we really try this out in such a way that we develop convincing evidence so that policymakers start paying more attention to the potential within culturally responsive pedagogy. Um, this is a really tough one because if you look at Marjorie Orellana's work with her colleague Reynolds, they spent years in the Chicago community figuring out the language brokering practices of those kids. Now, I would like to ask Marjorie the next time I see her, would you do that again when you go to LA? Because if you really follow the tenets of culturally responsive instruction, you need to do that. Or you need to have some mechanism to determine that these kinds of practices actually are going on in a different place from where they, that you originally documented them. So that's kind of a dilemma. Um, culturally relevant instruction has definitely not had the impact it should have yet on student learning. And that's because I think as Christine Sleater points out, people think about it simply in terms of celebrating culture rather than its focus on academic achievement. And uh, there's a changing face of immigration. I've already alluded to that a little bit. Different groups are coming in. Uh, if you've done any work in the field of immigration, you know that as nations develop, they stop sending their, uh, their citizens to live abroad. So, I guess Irish immigrants, maybe we're still getting some, maybe with the current economic crisis, we'll see even more. But as Ireland developed its economy, there were fewer and fewer. Korea developed its economy, fewer and fewer. This is happening right now in Mexico. Uh, Mexico is one of the fastest growing economies in the world, surprisingly. Very, very interesting, even with all the issues going on right now. Um, we will see fewer and fewer students as their parents no longer need to look for work in other places. So, as each new group comes in, we'll have more work to do in terms of learning their, their practices. And so in other words, the work of culturally responsive pedagog or pedagogues will never be finished. So thank you very much. So now I'm ready for questions. Well, there's the slides were wrong. Mm. I can figure it out. Oh, okay. This one? No, but that was um, that first point is wrong. Oh. That one?
different critique even within a given ethnic or language community. And that practice of critiquing these social orders is indistinguishable from embedding the teaching practice in some way in, in the student's you know, ways of being and language and so on. They're related, but it's in pleasant tension to try to put them together these days. And, and another avenue for them is being, what, you did a good thing earlier, you in your own point of view yeah. on that point, for example, but also right. a, a critique of this and what your critique and your reason I guess might be. Then beyond that, there's the different standards of evidence. And um, it seems like in this literature, there's not really much of a concern about standards of evidence. Right. right. Yeah, the, the first point, these three points that, uh, made by Gloria Letts and Billing, I wish I had more time to talk to you. I, I know I forgot half of what I was hoping to be able to tell you. Uh, she makes it really clear in her work, if you read this particular article, it's in the American Educational Research Journal. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, I, I'm convinced by what she says, and her argument is that if we fail to do number three, all we will accomplish is to uh, sort of reinforce the existing social order. And, and, and if we don't bring about larger scale change, and there's probably lots of different ways to actually bring, bring about larger scale educational change. But one of the things I notice in her work, as well as Carol Lee's work, Geneva Gay's work, is this incredible passionate uh, concern for justice and for fairness and the idea that this has simply not been the experience of so many students, their families, exactly. and their communities. I would disagree. I think you can think about a change of the, the existing social order in terms of its long-term effects, as well as in terms of short-term effects. The ability of political agenda to influence practice has to be more clear-cut outside of <laughs> And I suppose it would be possible to divorce um, social concerns for social justice from concerns for academic achievement. I think. Lots of folks do that. I think, um, I think Jim Cummins' critique is that that's the reason why mainstream um, educational reform efforts have not had the impact that they could have because they failed to recognize what he calls the sociopolitical roots of student failure. So they're, they're, it's a different way of thinking. It's a different way, but somebody wanted to say something, I thought. Sure. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you for talking to me today. Thank you.
Right. That's true. That's true. How, how is uh, the translate instructional approach culturally responsive? I think we're still thinking about that. I think it's culturally responsive in the sense that it values and recognizes the linguistic capabilities of the students and finds ways to incorporate that into the instructional activities that they are engaged in. So I think it fits within Geneva Gay's definition that culturally responsive instruction teaches to and through students cultural and linguistic strengths, their prior accomplishments and their intellectual capabilities. But you're right, and lots of folks who are in the field of language education often do s divorce um, issues of social justice from um, the, the, the instructional approaches that they implement in classrooms. It's very common in the world of TESOL, for example. Sure. Good. I saw somebody. Yeah. Uh, well, there's there's our work. And we're, we're only halfway through it, but I, I'm not familiar with any others at the moment. And, and, and I, think, I think this is one way to really, uh, one of the reasons, or one of the motivations that we have for engaging in this work is we want to provide teachers with an instructional approach that we've really thought about in terms of what are, what are the components that are most, what are the ingredients, I guess, that are most active? How can they um, get students involved to the maximum degree and move them forward with respect to their comprehension? And we're, we're still working that out. We've got a ways to go. Yes. I'll be on. <laughs> uh. Thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned um, dual language immersion, and I'm actually a dual language immersion teacher. And um, I, I wanted to um, hear more about your concerns about dual language immersion, because um, you, you referenced um, the privileging that can happen for uh, native English speakers. And I just wanted to say that that was uh, not my experience in my instruction. Um, I actually found that my native Spanish speakers really had a voice when we were in Spanish that they didn't have when we were in English. And I also thought it was very beneficial for my native English speakers because they had the experience of being, of feeling like they were um, not the experts and having to see a language through the eyes of um, someone who, who wasn't yet dominant. And I thought that, so for both sides, it was a very culturally um, enriching experience, but I wanted to, as I move forward, know what your concerns are so that hopefully we can combat those. Yeah, I'm a huge proponent of dual language immersion. I think it's a wonderful instructional approach and I've always liked it ever since I read Joshua Fishman's work way back in, I think he wrote in 1980 the first treatise on where he was recommending dual language immersion before anybody else was doing it and he was doing that on the basis of uh, the experience that Cuban Americans had had in, Fl in Florida schools where they were being taught by Cuban teachers in Spanish with the idea that they would be a very short time before they returned to the island of Cuba. And, and they were experiencing great success with it. Um, I, I, I think it, it has all of those qualities that you mentioned. Um, students from mainstream backgrounds learn the language of the students from, um, from minority language backgrounds and vice versa, typically most of the time. But there, had, there were voices, and it, it actually surprised me when I first heard them. And, and I think the best example of it is Guadalupe Valdez's article. And, and, and Professor Valdez, she's at Stanford, and 
she very eloquently argues we have to be really careful with this because as members of minority communities, we're giving our linguistic strengths to those members of the mainstream who will probably end up using that to move us out of potential employment opportunities in the future. So it is a concern. And I guess people have documented that uh, native English speakers often are treated differently by their teachers than the speakers of Spanish or Chinese. I, I lived in Eugene, Oregon for a while where Japanese was one of the languages that was used in a, in a single language immersion program for native English speakers. And the, 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 the native speakers' um, parents got really angry because the Japanese teachers that they brought in to teach them were imposing Japanese understandings of discipline. And, and, and the American parents found this really, really difficult to deal with. But that, those things do happen. I mean, and that's why I think design research is such a wonderful approach in terms of developing an idea before you take it sort of mainstream. Do you mind if I ask really quickly, sorry, just as a follow-up sure. question, if um, in Eugene, if, those were, if that was a choice program where those parents were choosing their students to be in that dual immersion program? Yes. I just, I mean, I just wanted to point out that that's an, that's an interesting facet of such programs is that often the parents choose, and so there's um, a certain element of multiculturalism that's inherent in, in the programs for that reason. But I agree with you. I, I just think it's, it's wise to pay attention to the concerns. Uh, right. That's, that's why I wanted to ask the question. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I just wanted to kind of, sorry, this gentleman, what's your name? Hi, I'm um, Jessica. I'm a master's student here. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, um, Professor Jimenez, I think that if you look at what's, what's happening in Arizona right now with, um, with instruction around Mexican culture and how that's being kind of basically banned, legally banned from the curriculum, um, that's one of the examples of why social justice is part and parcel of CRP because students are being told that their culture is not good enough, should not be taught to everybody, is not part of the, you know, I mean, when you have systemic oppression and systemic marginalization, as, our, as teachers, it's our responsibility to tell students, you can learn about your culture. I want to learn about it. It's important that all students learn about it. And I just wanted to know, Dr. Jimenez, um, how do you think that teachers in CRP can do that kind of activism work? You know, it's not vigilante, it's necessary as part of the process. And how does that happen in the framework of CRP? I, I think it's really difficult. Um, I'm in teacher education, I work with folks or young people who want to be teachers and they're going to be working with students from diverse backgrounds. And what you're talking about is they've got to change their attitudes. Their, understandings of students from linguistic and culturally diverse backgrounds. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, you have to want, you have to really love the students to be able to do this. And, and by love, I mean, you've got to want the best for them. And by wanting the best for them, you have to, you have to insist that they learn. That's what someone who loves you does. They don't let you go. They, make, they, they stick with you until you have learned what it is that you need to do in order to move forward. And, and, and it's a very, very tough, tough process. One of the ways we do this is we put them out in the schools. They're working with the kids. And they start seeing, these, these kids really know things. They can do things. They're not stupid. They're not fighting me. Uh, but they've got to get to know. And in fact, every one of the, the, the graduate students that I took with me to work with this particular group of kids, we all came away thinking, and these were all kids three years below grade level, three to four years below, we all said, they're all incredibly capable, they're all really smart, um, they can do this, but we've gotta figure out how to be better teachers to, to help them reach their potential, I guess is the way I look at it. But I don't, there's no really easy answers. This is tough, because we're trying to undo all the messages and learning that folks bring with it. That's why Carol Lee says that this requires a major change in the way we think about the young people and their communities and their families. Because traditionally schools have worked really hard to keep that out. And now we're saying you've got to find ways to bring it in.
people in the room. So this is, uh, as we said, uh, 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 an evening of celebration, and we have two people to celebrate more than Professor Jimenez. And we would like to first celebrate our Jean Chal Doctoral Dissertation Awardee, Chantal Francois. Well, This award is given to a graduating HGSE student whose dissertation has been noted for particular excellence in the fields of beginning reading, readability and reading difficulty, with special emphasis given to projects supporting adult literacy, reading assessment, early reading, graphophonemic processes, and stages of reading, writing, and vocabulary development. Anything you ever want to know about literacy and we're afraid to ask. <laughs> Chantel's doctoral dissertation is titled, The Social Dimensions of an Individual Act, Situating Urban Adolescent Students' Reading Growth and Reading Motivation in School Culture. Her thesis draws upon many methodologies to examine sociocultural factors that influenced unusually positive growth in achievement in an urban secondary school. Strength-based research. Thank you, Chantel. Francois found that the school community prioritized authentic literacy practices, such as independent reading, author visits, book clubs, along with critical opportunities to examine society through shared texts. These factors contributed to positive student performance and a stable reading motivation levels, and her research offers a counter-narrative to the backdrop of urban adolescent reading underperformance. Members of our faculty on her committee were Catherine Snow, Paolo Uccelli, and John Diamond. Chantel is currently assistant professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning at Rutgers University Graduate School of Education, where she teaches courses on middle school and high school English instruction. Additionally, and most near to our hearts, she was actually voted class doctoral marshal at last year's HGSE commencement. Please welcome and congratulate Chantel Francois. And secondly, I would like to introduce my new best friend. I met her at uh, quarter to not 10 this morning. <laughs> Caroline Mark, who is the sixth Jean Shaw Visiting Research Award winner. She will, uh, she fund, this fund uh, funds a visiting scholar to travel to HGSE and to utilize the Jean S. Chaw collection on the teaching of reading for their research, which is located in the special collections. Dr. Mark is currently a research associate at the University of Kansas's Center on Educational Testing and Evaluation. She received her PhD in special education from the University of Kansas in 2011. Her research will focus on defining treatment intensity for instructional programs that address reading disabilities. The outcome of her research will be the specification of a model for treatment intensity that is grounded in and informed by the research of Jean Chaw and her contemporaries. Carrie has noted uh, that defining treatment intensity will require an analysis of both past and present research. The extensive collection of reading resources at the Gutman Library would allow me to access seminal work related to instruction for individuals with reading disabilities. The results of this work will be dis disseminated to practitioners through major education networks, such as the National Center on Response to Intervention. Please congratulate Caroline Mark. 